Are you at risk for diabetes? Your family health history might offer clues. Hi, I'm Dr. Griffin Rogers, a director at NIH. Debbie Allen, legendary director, producer, actress, and founder of the Debbie Allen Dance Academy, explains. My family history with diabetes goes back to my grandparents, actually on both sides, but especially on my dad's side. My grandfather on my father's side died of complications of diabetes, as did my father as did uh, most of his brothers and sisters. My Aunt Ciola actually died in my arms. I am very vocal with my family about our DNA, our blood memory, our genetic code that diabetes has run in our family for generations. They are all very much aware of being on the lookout for pre-diabetes. Follow us at NIDDK.gov. This is Dr. Griffin Rogers. Low blood sugars can feel many different ways. I feel really tired. My vision changes. Definitely ravenous hunger, sweating. I get very dizzy and lightheaded. I get thirsty or I need to drink and even though I drink, it, it's still not quenching my thirst. I have confused thoughts. The major cause for my low blood sugar would be not eating in a certain amount of time. Injecting insulin and then failing to follow up with food. For me, I get low blood sugar when I've delayed a meal and I've taken insulin or I know the insulin is peaking. Also, when I have exercised more than usual. And another thing is when I drink alcohol. Sometimes I'll eat a piece of candy, uh, eat an apple, drink some soda. Always having glucose tabs on hand. When I walk, when I'm in bed at night, I have them on the nightstand. When driving, they're in my car. And I check my blood sugar every 15 minutes until it comes back up. I prevent low blood sugar by eating every two hours. If I'm planning on exercising a lot or doing yard work or activity where I'm not going to have food at hand, every four hours, I will either reduce my insulin or make sure I eat before I start that activity. So I've talked to my doctor about how to correctly treat low blood sugars because my problem is I over-treat. When you have low blood sugar, you might have brought your sugar back up, but you still feel the symptoms of low blood sugar and you want to keep eating. And then you bounce up and down and up and down. After telling my doctor that every now and then I would be lightheaded and dizzy, and he explained to me that that was from the low blood sugar. When I talk to my doctor about low blood sugar, he gives me some good pointers about how I should follow with food every time I take injections. Low blood sugar is very dangerous, and you have to try to not allow it to happen, but you have to take care of it as soon as possible. They need to know how they are feeling is very important. If they're feeling out of sorts, if they're feeling faint, if they're feeling maybe dizzy, or they're having unclear thoughts, they need to consider the fact that they could be having a low blood sugar incident. If you're having low blood sugar frequently, you need to talk with your doctor and you also need to keep records of when you have that low blood sugar because if you just go in and say, I have low blood sugar, without the records, we can't find a pattern. So you can't correct the problem. For those who are newly diagnosed, um, some, some tips are carry some candy with you, uh, soda, and some fruit.
today I'm extremely confident about treating low blood sugar. I know when it's coming on, I know what to do. I became confident treating my low blood sugar um, after my doctor explained to me what I needed to do. I, I do feel that I am prepared because I do carry some snacks, candy, um, soda, water, just in case. I became confident in treating my low blood sugar through trial and error. Uh, more error at first, but as I got better, I got better. Geriatricians face a lot of challenges when providing diabetes care, and the challenges really stem from the fact that most older adults don't just have diabetes. They're likely to have hypertension, many of them may have chronic renal disease, but they also may have things that aren't directly related to their diabetes, such as osteoarthritis, uh, chronic pain from other problems. I think the biggest challenges are really about setting priorities and making sure that you keep things as simple as you can, but at the same time making sure that you're offering the therapies that reduce morbidity and lengthen life and improve quality of life for patients. Another big challenge with caring for older adults with diabetes is that it is a very heterogeneous population. Now when you think about it, if somebody is 68 or 69, they could be a person who's had type 2 diabetes for 30 years, and it could be well controlled. But you could also have somebody at the same age who may have already had a stroke, who may have found out a year ago that they have type 2 diabetes. So we can't just go with age. We have to really think about life expectancy. We have to think about what are the other chronic conditions that the person has under treatment. We also have to think about their functional status, and we have to think a lot about their cognitive status and family support. We know that older adults with type 2 diabetes are much more likely to get a group of conditions that we call the geriatric syndromes than people who are of a similar age and don't have diabetes. These geriatric syndromes include gait problems and falls, cognitive impairment, higher rates of depression, higher rates of chronic pain, urinary incontinence, and challenges with what we call polypharmacy. Medicare beneficiaries, oftentimes people over 65 will be on six or more prescription drugs. And when you think about how hard it is to just take one antibiotic correctly when you get sick, you can imagine what it must be like uh, to try to take all of these pills correctly every day. The probability of drug-drug interactions creating yet a third symptom uh, happens quite frequently. Um, and as you know, medical regimens get more complex and more medications are added, adherence goes down. So in addition to taking care of the diabetes, these conditions really need to be screened for because many of them are treatable. And I have to mention that particularly depression travels a lot with diabetes. And we have a growing evidence base that if you don't treat the depression, it's very hard, not only for older adults, but for all adults to take care of their diabetes. You really have to take a very holistic approach to the person you're treating, and as much as possible, you need to engage them in shared decision making. So with patients with type 2 diabetes who are older, the frail ones and the people with impaired cognition, there are a lot of family meetings in these decision making sessions. And you know, we really as a group have to decide what's going to be the most feasible and practical care plan to keep someone's quality of life as high as possible for as long as possible and to keep the burden of our treatments as low as possible. The guiding principles have a lot of very useful information for taking care of older adults. And the document that came out of this process has 10 guiding principles. They're very practical 
And for all of us who care for older adults with type 2 diabetes, it provides a very efficient place to find that information. Um, so I would encourage you to look at it and incorporate some of the suggestions into your practice. I think you'll find it helpful.